self-serving memoir, as I say, even if you say so yourself. But you were there at the time of all of this. How much of it did you see coming in 2007 8 Well, we saw that there were real problems, that what was happening couldn't go on. But I don't think it was easy to see exactly how the problems would play out. And nor was it easy for any bank or country or central bank to be the first to deal with this. It really did require a collective response. And I think that's one reason why the crisis developed and why we haven't got out of the economic problems that have followed, that no one country can easily handle it on its own. I mean, looking back as you do in the book, do you feel that you could have done more? Should you have done more, do you think? Well, I'll leave others to judge that. I think we did, did a lot, but I don't think on our own we were capable of solving the problems that generated a global financial crisis. And that's what the book is about, which is saying, well, look, let, let's, let's reflect now, let's not blame anyone. What do we need to do to make the banking system safer? And how can the world as a whole reach that sustainable recovery that we've been looking for for so many years now and not found? But you make it clear that it didn't come out of thin air, that mistakes were made. Well, you can call them mistakes, but... You the, call them the, mistakes. Yes, but the, under, the, the mistakes were, were of ideas. And I think the failure was to recognise the consequences of globalisation, of the fact that interest rates around the world were being pushed down as China and others were saving so much. And instead of responding to that by trying to bring about a rebalancing of the world economy, countries, understandably, out of their own self-interest, tried to lower their own interest rates to boost demand. And the world before 2007 was remarkably stable on the surface. But beneath that, the problems were building up. To what extent were banks like RBS, the Bank of Scotland, responsible for those mistakes that you talk of? Well, I don't think we should... You know, if, if Fred, Fred Goodwin did not cause the global financial crisis. Uh, that he was, was one of the great scapegoats at the time, though. Yes, but I mean, the press and others, I'm sure not your programme, look for scapegoats. But and I understand why people feel angry, and, and therefore it's natural to look for scapegoats. But the underlying causes were much deeper. Uh, neither he in this country nor Dick Fold in Lehman Brothers in the United States alone, single-handedly, created this crisis. But you warn that another crisis is certain and you say sooner rather than later. That's got to be worrying for everyone watching this. So it's not, I'm not suggesting it'll happen tomorrow, but I do think that since the banking system remains vulnerable to a loss of confidence, I mean, if you and I and everyone else went to take our money out of the banks in which we deposit it, they couldn't give it to us. And I want to make sure that banks have to take out insurance up front in good times such that the Bank of England could supply the money they would need in bad times if we did ask for our money back. It's a bit like motorists driving on a road. We make them take out insurance, third-party insurance, before they go on the road, not after they've had an accident. That's surely an argument for much tougher regulation even than we've had since the crisis. Well, whether it's tougher, uh, I don't know. But what it is, is a systematic approach to saying you banks must take out sufficient insurance to make sure that the central bank will be willing to give you the money that you would need if things really went wrong. And we haven't done that yet. But if you're so sure that another crisis is going to happen, and going to happen sooner rather than later, what's going to cause it? What's the spark? Well, it's very hard to know what the spark is. But I think at present, it, it could be in China, because their financial system is in trouble. It could be in a number of emerging market economies who've borrowed a great deal. Or it could be in the euro area. For us, what is fortunate is that our banking system and the American banking system are safer than they were, but actually it's no comfort to us if the euro area or China get into serious pr trouble because that will affect the demand for our exports and we'll suffer as a consequence. You're very critical of the eurozone and the single currency. I am, because I think it was poorly designed and they've got themselves into a position now where there are no easy answers. Every route out for the euro area now is going to be painful for them. And it was a very good uh, outcome that we didn't join. Is it really, as you say in the book, the most divisive development in post-war Europe? Do you think it is? Well, I do, because when the monetary union began, Germany joined it out of the best of motives. It joined it because it was trying to bind Germany into the rest of Europe so no one else would be frightened of Germany. And Germany sacrificed the most important symbol of its post-war success, which was the Deutschmark. It sacrificed that to go into the monetary union. And what was the result? Germany is now more economically and politically dominant than it was when monetary union started. And in countries like Greece or Italy, the sentiment towards Germany is more angry now 
than it has been since the end of the Second World War. You sound like you're going to vote to leave. No, I don't think this has anything as such to do with membership of the European Union. This is about the euro. And we should be concerned about the euro, irrespective of whether we stay or whether we leave. Because the euro is our biggest trading partner, and it will remain our biggest trading partner, whatever uh, membership of the EU uh, is decided. And as such, it matters to us that the euro area is a successful part of the European economy. And at but you present, don't think I worry it can be? It. Well, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for them to escape the problems that they have. And that's why I describe in the book the different things that could happen to them. They could carry on with austerity and unemployment. They could have inflation in Germany. They could have a situation where German taxpayers permanently have to bail out countries in the south, or they will have to find a way of breaking the monetary union up. And, and none of these options are attractive to those currently running it. They're just hoping by pushing the so problem down the road... So where will you stand when it comes to the vote, then? Sorry? Where will you stand?